so administrative stuff, sharing stuff, everything on the slides is TLP white, it's being live streamed, so obviously I don't care that it's broadcast over the internet. Uh, tweet away, whatever. Uh, I do have some private information, that's TLP red. If you're interested in that, come find me afterwards. Uh, of some uh, infrastructure uh, that we're actually uh, more proactively monitoring, and I'll point that out in the slides. <coughs> this brief introduction. I manage one of the threat intelligence teams for Fidelis Cybersecurity. I also teach uh, computer science at the University of Illinois, uh, and actually told them I want a room like this to lecture in uh, when I get back home, and I suspect I am not going to get that at all. Also with a group uh, called the Internet Storm Center, I'm one of the 40 some odd uh, incident handlers, uh, uh, volunteers uh, that provide a lot of information out there for free as well. Provide open source intelligence feeds. I'm sure at least a few people in this room are familiar with uh, the DGA feeds uh, that I produce. A lot of what I do professionally, at least I try to gear towards, is tracking criminal threats. I try to avoid APT, nation state espionage stuff as much as possible. Uh, and I really try to uh, assist uh, criminal prosecutions and get some of these people locked up. So that uh, is kind of a, a starting point, uh, an inspiration for where uh, I gear my work and how I direct my efforts. So why track exploit kits, right? Uh, as I said, right, I deal with criminal actors. Uh, every now and then I manage to get somebody arrested for something, but it is a very long process. Uh, that could take months, if not years. And usually, very, fairly quickly after an arrest happens, something else takes its place. So as an example, with Operation Tovar, which took over or took down Game Over Zeus uh, and CryptoLocker, uh, that person was just indicted. Uh, he's a Russian citizen that uh, U.S. law enforcement can't reach. Uh, CryptoLocker is gone, Game Over Zeus is gone, but obviously ransomware is still here. Uh, it's more prevalent now than it was uh, when we took down CryptoLocker in 2014, uh, and we certainly still have banking Trojans also. So my thought is, you know, what if we can go after the ecosystem uh, behind that, just create data, uh, data sets that allows us to get towards the economic relationship uh, behind these criminal operations, right? Uh, so as I mentioned, you know, these operations take months, if not years. Um, the ecosystem itself, the starting point of malware. Did this just, okay. Um, either comes in via email, some spam lure, or web stuff. That's the predominant two methods. So we're going to talk about web. Uh, and the thought is, what if we could just smash that ecosystem, take away the mechanisms by which this is distributed uh, to get some more uh, longer term impact? I swear this slide worked when I looked at my slides 30 minutes ago, but it's basically just an infographic of all of these items, right? So when you think about criminal operations online, cybercrime, there's a lot of different players involved uh, in a, a fairly segmented, regimented uh, economic uh, marketplace. You know, you've got people who write malware, uh, the people who uh, run and operate malware delivery mechanisms the people who write exploits uh, for various CVEs and generating traffic, people who sell in compromised websites that can be used for exploit kits, the people who operate the marketplaces themselves, the underground forums or whatever where the buying and selling takes place, uh, Bitcoin washing services, which I love when criminals use Bitcoin because despite the idea that it's anonymous, it is not private. So there's a lot of means to follow money in Bitcoin, uh, even going through washing services, right? What inspired me on this thought process was, uh, as you heard from uh, Vladimir yesterday with Lurk, earlier this year, uh, the Lurk group of about 50 individuals was arrested. Now, they didn't operate Angler, but had a close economic relationship with the people behind Angler, so Angler went away. There was a big impact outside of just those 50 individuals who was arrested and their criminal operations. There were several other operations uh, that were uh, disrupted as well. So what if we could just create surveillance and data sets that allow us to do similar things in a more targeted way? In the case of Lurk, uh, that group was targeted for their own criminal operations. What if we can create data sets that allow us, allow us in law enforcement to create better targeting uh, to maximize our impact? 
So as far as intelligence priorities, I work for a security vendor, right? So my first step is always to make sure my products still work to protect against those threats, but we're not gonna talk about that. Uh, that's what every security company does. Uh, the second is to develop that in intelligence, uh, tracking the exploit kit operators, what their payloads are, what exploits they're using, to use the technical surveillance to create more economic intelligence in terms of how these players are interacting, who is buying and selling from whom, uh, instead of going after one given botnet or one affiliate of uh, some criminal effort, right? Uh, what isn't a priority with this is directly operationalizing the data, right? And uh, this isn't gonna work either, but uh, it was a nice animated GIF of a boat falling into the ocean and breaking apart. The point of this, what would have been this animated GIF was all of these tools the, with doing technical surveillance, everything that we're monitoring is under criminal control and they know we're doing this and they actively deceive things. So whether it's my DGA feeds or the malware configs I produce or this tracking, right? Other uh, scrutiny, other, there needs to be another step before putting this into a blacklist or whatever uh, because attackers will put 8.8.8.8 in a malware config just to get somebody to block Google's DNS servers and create, uh, create impact. So there's active deception going on. Uh, but I have the advantage I work in intelligence, not in operations, so I don't have to deal with operationalization, uh, operationalizing data. I could just say, you know what, let's just talk about the intelligence. That's somebody else's problem. But I do like bringing it up because people like feeds and whatever, right? But some other scrutiny has to be paid. We all know what an exploit kit is, set of tools, you know, using some exploit uh, to ultimately deliver malware on a system. Rarely, in terms of the exploit kits we're talking about, are O-Days involved, zero-day exploits involved. Maybe once a year, I wanna say Neutrino, maybe a month and a half ago used a zero-day, so I believe that was the only one this year off the top of my head. But by and large, they're using uh, old ex older exploits. Uh, some dating back to 2012, right? You know, so obviously, right? Patch your stuff and it becomes less of an issue for you. There are lots of exploit kits out here. Uh, this was from uh, Malware Bytes Fall Roundup of what they see are the prominent ones. Uh, a couple of rig variants, uh, Sundown, Neutrino, Magnitude, Nastrum. There are a lot that are dead and gone. Uh, and there's an ebb and flow in terms of which gets, uh, which is more dominant uh, over time. Uh, and there's a good little infographic from Kehu Security uh, of basically a Wild West little wanted poster of exploit kits and then the whole list of things that are dead and gone uh, underneath. So, uh, but there's a long history involved uh, in this. As a preliminary point, um, all, many malware families, right, have some kind of campaign identified or affiliate ID, some tracking mechanism, right? Completely useless for operationalizing, right? If I knew a campaign ID for a given rat, I, I can't put that in a feed. There's no reason to even bother detecting that, right? But for intelligence, right, that's very useful. Locky has an affiliate identifier, numeric identifier, uh, for each binary that comes out there. I can use that to say, you know what, affiliate ID three came down in this exploit kit and this spam botnet and uh, used .NET or whatever it used uh, in these DGA seeds to start making some conclusions. Uh, one of the things that I noticed with Locky in particular, and I'm, like I said, I'm not entirely sure why uh, my GIFs aren't showing up on this, this monitor, but the, it has a DGA seed also. The DGA seeds are shared among affiliate IDs, meaning you know affiliate ID three, five, seven, whatever, may have the same DGA seed and also by as a consequence use the same command and control infrastructure, which tells me something about the economics of the people operating Locky, right? That affiliate ID, if it's an affiliate program, there is a central source controlling the money and they're tracking it on their end. Hey, I've got a thousand affections from affiliate ID three, 500 from affiliate ID five, uh, and there's somebody who's just paying access. So I have some understanding uh, of the economics behind that and can use that to correlate other data points. 
as an example, right, you know, that's one example, but for malware that's derived, uh, you know, one of my other research projects is, is just creating a database of just malware configs. Knowing how to do that, you rip that, put that in a database, and then over however long you've done it, my data set's about a year right now, I can start correlating things even across malware families. Hey, this specific domain name was used with uh, this malware family and this rat a year ago, or I could see campaign identifiers that are unique enough to be relevant that are used and start correlating things and seeing the relationship, the technical relationship between malware attacks, uh, but hopefully start getting towards the economic relationship underneath, right? Because, uh, you know, when you're talking about cybercrime, it's essentially an economic crime, so the economic intelligence does matter. Uh, so this starts to have the raw building blocks of doing things uh, what uh, the FSB did uh, accidentally or incidentally uh, with the lurk takedown. Now I can say, you know what, I'm gonna target these pieces because I know they're the most economically important things instead of the most technically relevant stuff for us. So instead of going for, hey, I know this botnet, so I'm gonna go after these C2s, you could say, you know what, I'm gonna go after this infrastructure instead because that's the economic linchpin uh, of all of this. So your basic uh, exploit kit process, victim clicks on something, there's some validation of suitability, uh, which is relevant for our discussion, right? There's some geo-blacklisting or geo-targeting. Uh, many malware families, for instance, uh, or at least malware actors who operate inside the Russian Federation, that's where they live, will explicitly black, uh, uh, blacklist uh, Russian victims uh, to uh, encourage law enforcement to uh, ignore them. Uh, vulnerable browsers, and then there's some blacklisting of sandboxes uh, and security researchers, which we'll talk about. And the victor, a victim is directed to an actual exploit and installation of, of malware. Most of these exploit kits, or all of the exploit kits, have URL patterns that are discernible. Uh, you can use Perl compatible regular expressions uh, to figure that out, uh, uh, to match just the URL patterns. I believe the ones I have on the slide are for Neutrino, uh, some older variations of Neutrino anyway. So if you're running a web proxy log or just have web traffic generally somehow, you can simply use these regular expressions to say, you know what, this is, this is uh, a Neutrino uh, hit without knowing any other context whatsoever, uh, just with the URL path, you can spot that uh, with regular expressions in many cases. In other cases, you'd need uh, richer data. Uh, but there's some pattern in all of this that you can discern uh, and use to start saying, hey, this is exploit kit versus normal web traffic. So an important point of doing this research, right, is having a non-attributable network, something that doesn't actually point back to my organization. Uh, there is blacklisting, so when uh, exploit kits become aware of who security researchers are, uh, they'll say, you know what, I'm not gonna deliver payloads to those IP addresses, okay? Um, probably, as a general rule, I don't like exposing my identity to criminals or anything about my identity to criminals for obvious reasons, but there's some technical reasons here also, right? You're just not gonna get mal malware, and at that point, right, all your surveillance breaks down. For whatever particular reason, uh, these operators don't really block commodity VPN services though. So IP vanish, hide my ass, we, you know, the, any of the normal ones that consumers will use, uh, they don't tend to block those for whatever particular reason, even though the IP addresses are pretty well known. Um, so they provide some, a, a resource for this research So running exploit kit surveillance through commodity VPNs versus setting up your own op uh, open VPN endpoints. Uh, is perfectly viable, right? Has the advantage of picking what country you're from. So if I wanna see what exploit kit traffic looks like in uh, Germany or France or uh, Australia, to start seeing how different exploit kits behave in different countries, again, gives me some economic information behind the actors uh, who are running these things, right? Um, there are limits, of course, to what you can retrieve in a VPN. Uh, one of the problems that we ran into uh, ultimately is like, okay, where do you put this VPN? All of this we're running through Cuckoo. Um, so 
You could put VPN in the VM itself, but you'd be adding a whole be oh, yeah, a significant amount of runtime to everything, to every, every uh, URL you're checking. What well, sets up the VPN tunnel, you'd have to basically put in a wait of 30 seconds or however, however long just to make sure the VPN tunnel's established. In our case, we put it outside the Cuckoo instance using PFSense to force everything through a VPN, uh, and that seemed to work except uh, for a given batch job, the IP address is the same. So uh, an exploit kit operator will see the same IP address, keep hitting their exploit uh, exploit kit over time. Uh, I want to say we do about 400 URLs uh, per rig. So uh, there would the IP address is exposed, but we haven't seen any overt blacklisting of that yet. Okay. Another difficulty we ran into, there's no central management of, of a cluster of Cuckoo installations. So for geographic uh, analysis, we have to set up you know, a, uh, a system uh, of Cuckoo instances that go for Germany and a different set of one for the United States and a different set of one uh, for other countries. Uh, provided there's a little bit of complexity, uh, but we just ran multiple uh, instances, each with its own VPN out to the outside world. Okay. Every exploit kit has its own unique set of exploits uh, that it uses uh, and CVEs that it exploits. Uh, and there is some overlap, obviously, of you know, Java or Flash exploits between all of them but there is unique signatures you know, in all of them. Somebody may exploit a given CVE for Java differently, uh, though it still has the same uh, net effect, right? So when setting up the VM, some care had to be done of making sure that we did the right set of exploitable versions, uh, but it also provides an ability to track the exploit writers, right? Okay, you know, I can see a given Java exploit used in rig and neutrino, now I know something about that exploit writer. And the important point of that is, like in our industry, the people who write exploits that are, that are actually production quality, right, are very few. If you go after those people, now that's real viable uh, disruption to the criminal ecosystem if you go after exploit writers. It is a very rare skill, uh, even among criminals. Uh, there's a tracking sheet out there that's done by Contagio Dump uh, of all the exploit kits observed and what exploits they use, uh, just what CVEs, uh, you know, but uh, there's a new version of that coming soon. I think it may even be up now. Uh, but you can see the overlapping nature of some of the exploits, but each of them have a unique set. And how that changes over time, you know, tells us something that might be, uh, that might be useful. Okay. So the easiest way uh, to, to, to deal with this is having VM images for specific exploit kits. So uh, creating virtual machines to say this one is vulnerable to the rig set of stuff versus magnitude versus neutrino and, uh, and so on and so forth. But still monitoring for, uh, for new exploits and some of those changes, right? There is a small ecosystem for that. And specifically, you know, looking for zero day exploits. Uh, you know, I said happens once a year, so it's not a very common occurrence, but it's still relevant. And as I'm sure many of you know, zero days have, uh, you know, great economic worth, uh, which is why they tend not to be put into exploit kits, because once you put a zero day in an exploit kit, you know, then your vendors start immediately working on patching. So you're burning a quarter million dollar piece of intellectual property for something that lasts uh, in, the, in the time scale of weeks. Uh, but still needing to be aware of that uh, and tracking signatures of that uh, as you can. Uh, kind of the first entry point of exploit kits is the landing pages. There are tools to decode those to get a lot of configuration information out of them. Uh, you know, similar to malware, it's pages. Is this cutting in and out, or is that just my imagination? All right, hopefully that's better. 
Um, so there are tools to decode exploit kit landing pages. Uh, there's a GitHub URL there. Uh, added rig and sundown recently, uh, but has neutrino, nuclear, and angular. So it exports, like I said, a rich set of configuration data, encryption keys, uh, you know, the, the actual exploit paths. Um, so like I said, it requires, you know, that first landing page or flash file that you can rip out of Cuckoo or via a PCAP. Here's an example of the data that's produced. You know, what are these eight, 10 URLs right here that are relevant to take a look at? Uh, you can also start looking at uh, Hello? There, okay. Um, yes. Um, so, it was closer. <laughs> Here? All right. Um, so, as an example of uh, you know, an exploit kit binary that came down. Or Like this? Okay. All right. I totally forgot the point of what I was going to say about this slide now. There's some hexadecimal stuff. It's interesting. Look at it. So um, some other considerations, right? Uh, Cuckoo itself, as it runs, right, stores a ton and generates a ton of data, uh, a lot of which is not necessarily overtly relevant, especially when you're running a bunch of, uh, a bunch of URLs through it uh, every hour. I don't really care about all the API, system API calls that are happening because it's all the same API calls every time. Open web browser, run URL, right? So a lot of the logging was turned off. All I really care about is, uh, is the PCAPs, drop binaries, uh, and, and getting that information to extract for further analysis. Um, obviously, like I said, you can run Yara uh, and volatility to get to uh, signatures of the drop malware, uh, you know, for post-processing later, right? You know, this is Locky, send it to some decoder uh, that pulls out the configuration, right? Uh, and again, to emphasize the point of using a non-attributable network. The key to all this is inputting something into Cuckoo to say, okay, to start this process. So, you know, how do you find the landing gauges, the initial gates? Uh, there has to be targets, right? Uh, there's only really a small subset of things. You can work backwards from an infection event, which is the most inefficient, but, you know, the, pretty much what we have in IR, using web proxy logs if you have them uh, in an organization, uh, or telemetry uh, if, if you're a vendor or an operating uh, or an OS provider. You can create a crawler if you'd like, or you can trick the exploit kit to just give you the initial gates, which we'll talk about. Working backwards from an infection, right? Least efficient way of doing it because you're waiting for somebody to be exploited, uh, but it's kind of the, the starting point for IR uh, and SOX to do, uh, to do this. So, um, you know, it's all we can do in, in a lot of cases when there's a new exploit kit created or significant changes to an exploit kit uh, where uh, our existing surveillance techniques don't work. Uh, those initial gates are transient resources. So it's possible that, hey, something was infected by the time I actually do the full IR process. Uh, I can no longer uh, use that gate for anything because it's, uh, it's come and gone, somebody cleaned it up, any number of things could happen, right? One of the other points is that you're limited to only what's attacking you or your customers, right? Uh, there is a large bias uh, in my customer base, the telemetry I get, because all of our customers are enterprises or government or military. Actually, military doesn't give us telemetry, but predominantly the United States. So it, it's, there's a geographic bias in the data set I had, uh, so needed to create something else uh, to get an idea of uh, a more representative, uh, globally representative data set. 
Uh, you can use PCREs to hunt, again, if you have web proxies uh, or telemetry. It still has to be a user visiting something, uh, but the exploit may not fire. Uh, so you still have the logs to say, hey, this person went to this URL. No exploit event happens, so your SOC doesn't have to do anything. But that URL is still there. Reactive, right, you know, but still can be uh, programmatically, you know, fed into uh, a pipeline uh, into uh, Cuckoo, right? So fairly easy to programmatically do things there, which is, which is an advantage, right? A smaller time scale between observation and processing, right? But again, right? Your user base is not necessarily globally representative, so uh, you, you're leaving uh, leaving stuff on the table. You can use a crawler uh, to go through that. Uh, it's inefficient, right? Because creating a crawler to crawl the entire internet uh, is time consuming. There's a lot of development, a lot of data that's being stored and created that you may or may not care about, uh, and certainly it's very resource intensive. A lot of bandwidth is involved, right? but it can have a global footprint and be very thorough, right? That is, uh, that is a way to do this. The good news is, is Microsoft has, uh, uh, as I believe, uh, I, I forget the precise name of the program, but it's available to uh, MAP and VIA members uh, to get threat intelligence data through Microsoft. And one of the products there uh, is called Bing Malicious URL. So anything flagged as malicious by the Bing crawler, and as many of you know, Bing crawls the entire world, so there's a whole lot of data there. As an example data point, in August, uh, uh, when we started processing that, there were 26 million URLs delivered every day uh, by this service that I'm not grabbing the antenna anymore. Um, now, the downside of that is, is much more than just exploit kits uh, in there. So there's some further categorization that are needed. I think they provide seven categories of a very general nature. Uh, so uh, processing this data to limit it to just exploit kits is needed. As an example of what that data looks like, tab delimited provides some uh, fairly useful data up front. Uh, you will see the same domain represented multiple times because it is URL, it's a crawler, so it cares about full paths. So the same domain may be represented multiple times, and I think on this slide it's all the same domain, right? Yeah, it's some blog spot in Argentina. Uh, gives you an IP address, where that IP address is based, ASN, and then some description, right? The descriptions are like a general nature. There isn't really an exploit kit. Uh, descriptor, so things would have to be uh, processed. While Bing is globally representative, there's still some biases in there. Uh, that same data point of 26 million, uh, 500,000 some odd URLs uh, were within China. So uh, that is what, roughly 2%. So think of the size of China and the size of its you know, internet footprint, and that only 2% of perceived web maliciousness is in China. Obviously, there's something in there creating geographic bias, you know, but it's better than relying on telemetry that has nothing Chinese at all. Um, the number is still misleading, right, because, like I said, the repetition of domains. The one other thing that I noticed is that this data set also flags interesting advertiser behavior. Right, the line between uh, you know advertiser tactics and tracking people uh, and malicious activity is quite small. The the, the things look fairly similar uh, from a heuristic standpoint, uh, so that had to be accommodated as well. So initially, right, you know, a very quick way to process this would be again using those Perl compatible reg regular expressions uh, for the various exploit kits. Uh, Nathan Fowler puts out a good list. There's a few open source. Uh, locations uh, to get exploit kit uh, regular expressions, but simply just look for those regexes uh, and uh, look for uh, what could uh, also be uh, matching those patterns. With this data set, it also becomes possible to do things like bulk cleaning up of, of uh, compromised websites. Um, I don't know of a great automated way to do it, but the ad hoc nature of which we do abuse reporting and cleaning up uh, certainly creates, you know, probably more opportunity for criminals than there ought to be. Uh, 
uh, but if with uh, proper filtering and, and making sure that you're really focusing on things that need to be cleaned up, uh, you can start doing reports to uh, net block owners to say, hey, these 100 domains on your net block are compromised that were seen yesterday by the Bing crawler. Please clean that up uh, and hopefully, you know, uh, lead to a more cleaner internet. Uh, Shadow Server also has a service uh, that, you know, allows you to uh, register ownership of a net block and they will send you uh, reports of various things. Oops. So as an example of filtering uh, the malicious URLs or PCREs, right, you just apply that uh, and immediately off the top it gave me, actually gave me 238 if I recall uh, from this particular run uh, of one-eighth of the data set. So probably 2,000 some odd URLs uh, and that Bing data of 26 million were immediately identified as exploit kit, uh, uh, exploit kit URLs. So from there, right, you can streamline, pipeline that into uh, Cuckoo, start running it, start getting drop malware uh, and doing analysis and driving intelligence out of that. The last way to get those initial pages is tricking the exploit kit infrastructure itself to give it up. Uh, some of the best automation system administration techniques are by malware operators because they have a need of really managing configuration, managing all of their infrastructure to be fairly reliable uh, and controlled so that they can manage it. Uh, most of these malware delivery networks you pay for a service, I want 100,000 infections, I want 200,000 infections. So there has to be some way to say, hey, you know what? This malware only bought 200,000, now we're switching to the next customer in the list, right? So there's automation that they have that manages it. There's some back end. If you know where that back end is and find a vulnerability, you can say, hey, give me all of your compromised web pages, give me all of the gates you're, you're acting on, uh, and give that to me in real time, and then pipeline that into Cuckoo. I have that data set, I'm happy to share it, not really happy to live stream it on the internet, so if you wanna see it, I'll show it to you, but there is, uh, you know, reused IP addresses, reused infrastructure uh, in, uh, in one of these systems where I could disrupt that ecosystem should I so desire. Uh, but I'd prefer the actor not knowing that I have that information. Okay. So now we have all that, that's all of the pieces, right, of, you know, finding the initial landing pages, whether it be a web, uh, web proxy logs or telemetry, uh, using uh, the Bing malicious URLs uh, to get those URLs into a sandbox and start, uh, start running through your pipeline. Uh, using a non-attributed, net, multiple non-attributed networks uh, in different geographies to see what things look like in Germany, or United States, or Brazil, or wherever, to get the idea of what nations they're targeting. Uh, you can retrieving that first landing page to get uh, get to the drop malware uh, and to the various exploits. Uh, you can tie uh, that drop malware to country exploit kits. Um, and, like I said, see the economic reality behind the technical indicators. Uh, but one important point, which I hadn't mentioned yet, is that usually repeat visits from the same IP address uh, in your Cuckoo instance, you're not going to still keep getting the same malware, but really you only need it once to create this pattern uh, of economic relationships. Um, you only need it, I don't need 10 copies of the same specific locky binary. Um, they sell by infection, so they're very cautious of making sure they get 100,000 unique victims versus 100,000, or a machine victimized 100,000 times, right? Uh, and then you could further mine that, uh, that data for configuration information uh, to correlate activity over time. If you're interested in exploit kit tracking, uh, I do have uh, uh, an intelligence group for that. Uh, that uh, I can add you into. We do put all this data into a MISP. It's not quite production grade yet, uh, but if you want access to that, drop me an email. The malware repository, the malware configuration repository is production, so if you want access, go ahead and drop me an email. I can get that to you. Uh, the DGA feeds I, rep uh, uh, I referenced briefly uh, are at that URL. 
and one shameless prog. I do run a charity where I try to build schools in Tanzania, so this means I'm always begging for money. If you can donate, any questions? You're letting me off easy. Yeah. <laughs> Here we go. Do you spot like patterns or shifts in exploit kit development uh, when you're tracking all those exploit kits? Um, certain shifts in uh, geographically or maybe actors? Is there anything you can comment on that one? So, uh, do I spot shifts in exploit kits? Uh, the answer is yes, it varies by exploit kit. Uh, and in terms of geographic targeting, that changes somewhat more frequently. I don't have a long enough data set yet, because this is recent, to be able to discern if that is a choice of the exploit kit or if that is a choice of the malware that they're, uh, that's trying to be delivered. And I suspect it's a little bit of both, but that varies by each exploit kit. And I don't really have a long enough data set to really say anything conclusive about the economic realities as to why that is. I've only got a few months of data. So you told everybody to be nice to the speakers, and now no one wants to ask any questions. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm an American, I can take abuse. Just look at who we elected. <laughs> John. Yes. Um, so when you do the cell analysis with a cuckoo, mm -hmm. you get a real infection, right? Mm -hmm. So would those count towards those 10, 100,000 or whatever customers would pay for? And if you would do that enough from different IP addresses, couldn't you just create fake infections? Mm -hmm that would economically somehow have an influence or? I am not above economic sabotage of criminal actors. I don't know how well that would scale in this particular case because, you know, okay, can I set up VMs on an IP address and get one, 10, 20 infections? Sure. I don't know how I would beget, begin to get 100,000 unique IP addresses to start using an entire thing. Well, I guess, I, know, I work for the University of Illinois. That's got 700,000 IP addresses, so maybe I can use my entire university IP address space and then get yelled at again by my security department. Plus, all the IP addresses would get blocked and you wouldn't get any real infections from those IP addresses. You wouldn't get repeat you malware. Uh, uh, you wouldn't get repeat... Uh, uh, repeat malware infections, but yeah. it, they probably wouldn't blacklist the entire University of Illinois well, you immediately. Just have to keep going and going until they do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, the blacklists, aside of the explicit ones for security research, it's kind of hard to discern exactly how they do it. Um, I don't have a long enough data set, right? There are some people that are explicitly blacklisted, right? And then there's some timeout value involved of saying, you know, I've already infected this person, I'm not gonna keep sending the same, the locky binary or whatever, uh, and I don't know exactly what that timeout value is. Do you keep tracks on, um, on the previous uh, vulnerabilities used? Uh, I explain, um, for example, in many cases, you have some watering hole techniques, so they just put the code somewhere, and you browse a legit uh, website, mm -hmm. and you trigger the, the exploit. So, um, do you keep a versioning of the, for example, Apache, uh, WordPress, etc.? Uh, to um, determine what uh, type of website will be compromised in the future, for, for example. 
So if I gathered your question, you're talking about vulnerable websites and the characteristics of, of what those vulnerable websites are. And no, I don't track that. I think it'd be very interesting to do, and it wouldn't be terribly difficult to fingerprint that stuff. I just never really thought about it because there's so much vulnerable CMS stuff out there that I don't know if that would give me useful information or not directly, but it probably would tell me something about the economics of a pattern of some actor out there compromising 10,000 WordPress sites because of a given plugin. It, 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 it might actually produce some intelligence, but I, I'd never really considered it until you asked, so I'd have to think about how to accomplish that. I used it uh, in the early days of Loki to mm -hmm. uh, determine uh, what uh, type of CMS uh, like OpenCart and, uh, and WordPress were used. So uh, it was really to, uh, to use uh, intelligence of crawlers like uh, Google and mm -hmm. so much more to, um, to determine um, a list before infection uh, by the by the the malware guys, um, so uh, so it could provide uh, an information of what you can monitor prior to uh, mm -hmm. to the attack. Yeah, no, I I think it would be useful. Yeah, I'd have to see how I'd integrate that. There was a uh... um, hi. Have you tried to purchase some of the exploit kits uh, offer? I am not above doing that. I have not really had a reason yet to do so. Um, the reason would be to profile. I mean, it, no one says, hi, I operate rig. Would you like 100,000 infections? They, they just offer the service. So there is, there is something to be said to tie forum personas to specific reg, uh, exploit kits. I have not quite gotten into that space yet because my corporate counsel only lets me do so much money laundering through Bitcoin. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not above doing it, but, but right now my budget for that is simply just buying malware builders. I haven't, I've, ex I bust all of my budgets, so uh, I don't have any money this year left. But that is definitely a, a thing I would do at some point in the future. Nobody on the upper deck. Actually, I, ha I have no. a question, John. Okay. Um, what, what we see when um, one specific exploit kit gets stopped, uh, so when Punch was mm -hmm. arrested, for instance, uh, he was replaced. Mm -hmm. They were replaced. So uh, what would be the strategy from your point of view to uh, really stop this business for, uh, let's say, four or five months to be mm -hmm. sure... Uh, uh, they 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 don't replace each other, etc. How how can th that be coordinated? How how could we do that? The intent ultimately is to have enough data to map kind of the economic relationship between malware operator and EK operator and exploit writer and marketplace, so that we can figure out where the key overlaps are and target those things that are a weak point of multiple other unrelated families. I don't have enough data to, to say where that is today, but that's the ultimate attempt is, you know what, this resource is used by seven other things, so if we hit that, it's disrupting seven things versus disrupting one. And I think the, the hope is, is, like I said, to get months worth of disruption instead of days or hours. Other questions? Okay, thank you very much, John. Thank you.